Pastor Bob Yandian, uh, with me this week. And I'll tell you, what we're going to get into today, I think, is a very vital word for you, for your family, especially with the landscape we're walking into, both politically, socially, and all of this. Some would say the zeitgeist of the culture needs to be adjusted, especially from the church's point of view, with what we're stepping into. But I really encourage you, right on the beginning of this broadcast, if you would, please repost this, share this somewhere, because somebody will get a now word out of this. I just believe God's going to help somebody. And at the same time, I want to thank our partners of this broadcast, of this ministry. You're so precious to us. We're so grateful uh, to you for being our partner. And if you want to become part of our partner family, you can do so by going to josephz.com. And we're so encouraged that you'd consider that. We'll call you, we'll stand with you, and uh, it's going to be a great thing when we stand together and begin to move uh, the call of God down the field, so to speak, to get victory. Um, today I have again with me the wonderful privilege of having Pastor Bob Yandian here. And I want to get into a number of things that I think are going to be very beneficial, especially regarding the current culture we're in. And so, Pastor Bob, thanks so much for being here again. Thank you. This is it's awesome. great to be here. Oh, man, it's awesome. I've enjoyed I, all four days that we've been. I've been enjoying yeah, it, too. Me, too. Man, you know, just talking with you, I, I glean, I learn so many things. Uh -huh. And you, I could talk to you, uh, like, all day because you have so much to say and bring out. You wrote a book, and uh, I want to get into this a little bit. It's called The Bible and National Defense. And I'm just kind of read the subtitle. It says, okay. what the Bible has to say about war and the price of freedom. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the idea with this book, but the Bible and national defense. And right, right in the beginning, you go into this topic of blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Yes. You know, we know where we are as a nation, America, or the nations. Uh -huh. How do we begin to right-size some of the points of view? And it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Well, I think we need a, nat a natural change and a spiritual change. Okay. And the spiritual change is get your head out of the clouds. Yeah. Okay. And yes, we do need to be led by the Spirit, all that, but there's also a natural side to it. Jesus taught the natural side as well as the spiritual side. Yeah. And that's the way it is with a nation. First of all, we have to stop and remember, we didn't put this nation together. God arranged it. Come on. Okay. Yeah. And yet he used normal men. They yes. were spirit-filled, some of them, but some of them weren't even Christians. We're not even sure some of them were Christians, yeah. but they were seeking after a godly nation. And I'd say godly, a moral nation. Mm. That's what they wanted was a moral nation. And they even said that this type of government won't work unless we have, you know, people of morality. Right. A nation would fall apart. But I believe that the one thing that uh, the book brings out that I think is is necessary too. When you serve God, you don't put your guns away. When you serve God, you don't put your your weapons away. That's good. That God even Himself uses a weapon. Jesus is going to come back with a big sword one day, <laughs> and it comes back yes. to it. If you want to protect, and it's only used for protection. That's the only thing for, or Amen. you know, or for food. But you don't go shooting innocent people, right. killing innocent people. But to carry a weapon is nothing wrong with that. That's right. It's found throughout the Word of God. You know, there's a, there's one. It's the most interesting thing when I found it. You know, we often use that scripture, be sure your sins will find you out. <laughs> it's quoted wrong. Be sure your sin, singular, will find you out. Oh, wow. And I went back, and as I was studying that, here's what happened. When the children of Israel went into the promised land, two tribes wouldn't go. They said, we want to settle on this side. Let the rest of them go and pay, but we want to stay on this side. So two tribes stayed here and 10 tribes went in. And Moses was talking to them about that before they went in. And he said this, he said, when, they, when your other tri tribes go in and they're at war, you come across and fight with them. And if you don't fight, he said, be sure your sin will find you out. He said, wow. not defending your nation is a sin. Oh, man. And told them that. Wow. So it gets pretty, uh, that's where the book takes off from that particular point. <laughs> runs kind of with a, it. That starts yeah, off with a bang That there. Jesus carries weapons. Mm -hmm. Jesus and his disciples carried weapons yep. when they were here, but never to use the wrong way. Once that Peter pulled it out and cut the guy's ear off, Jesus said, yeah. no, you're going to end up in jail. And then remove the evidence by putting the ear back on and healing it. <laughs> yeah, you know? that, that is a fascinating story. I know, it is a story. <laughs> but he could have gone to prison for that. And could rightfully have. so, even though... Yep emotionally and spiritually, he was defending Jesus. Jesus was saying, I don't need this. That's right. Put your weapon back up. This is not the proper use oh, of weapons. Man. So, but anyway, God has given us. And, and, you know, I appreciate when Christians have know the right way to handle a weapon, right. know the spiritual authority behind it. And uh, the disciples all carried weapons. So. And I think that's the balance too. Yeah. We're talking about not just national defense, but in life and all that. But 
the balance is, and I think we referenced this earlier, when Jesus was, you know, on, on earth and he was doing what he was doing, preaching, a group called the Zealots came along uh-huh. and they wanted to make him king. They're like, you know what? We're going to storm the castle yeah. with pitchforks and torches and he's uh-huh. going to become king. Yeah. And they misunderstood the purpose of his coming. I see that kind of as a parallel where there is, you know, uh, there's this term being thrown around today called Christian national. Yes. And where people say, well, you're a Christian nationalist. You're trying to just storm the castle and right size the whole thing and all this. Uh-huh. And yet, you know, there's, there's got to be a balance somewhere because we got to act, but we don't want to overstep at the Word of God. Says. Exactly. Can you help us, Pastor Bob? Well, Christian nationalism is true. I agree with that. Yeah. If you're a Christian, you should love your country. I'm yeah. not telling Germans to love America. I'm right. not telling others. Right. They should be as much strong for their nation as they're because God put nationalism in here. Right. The reason he put nationalism in here was because of the Tower of Babel. Come on. All of them came together and it is international communism. We're going to drop all boundaries yeah. and drop all borders and we're going to build this thing and we're going to be as God. So that's exactly what communism thinks. So God broke it down, then separated everybody by different uh, races and, and languages and stuff like that. And there suddenly became boundaries between nations. But the reason God does that is so when totalitarian comes in, if you have nationalism, there's another nation you can run to. Yeah. And Satan wants to do away with that. He wants to have one international government, communism, all covering the entire earth where there's no right nation to run to. Every nation is run by the same government, and he's trying to. In, he what he's trying to do is imitate Jesus when he comes. Yeah, Jesus will have one world, but the beauty of it is we're going to have Jesus running the world, not the devil running the world. That's so powerful, yeah. Pastor Bob. But they need to have nationalism too. So we can't just say, "Well, we're the best in the world." I believe, our, as far as my concern, and I believe they should think they have the best in the world. Absolutely. And on top of that, but you, you respect the boundaries of these nations. So yep. that's kind of where the book comes from that you respect the nation you have, but understand that God is the one that originally made nations and nationalism. It's his idea. Yeah, it's his idea. And I think of that too, because you know, when you talk about the Tower of Babel, that was like in, you know, you had Adam, and then you had the anti-Adam. You know, you had, yeah. uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Nimrod. Nimrod. Nimrod stands up, and he, you know, we shall rebel, and we're going to be one. And they're really wanting to just pervert what the Lord has purpose for the millennial mm-hmm. reign. Right. And all that. So... I, you know, I've never heard it that way when you said the reason it's important to have nations is because if your nation goes bad, you have nowhere to run to. And I'm kind of paraphrasing what mm-hmm. you said. Yeah. That's a powerful concept. God made it so there would be that type of setting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But in the meantime, you have those that for no reason at all, except for greed, want to attack the nation next to them and take all their stuff, kill them and all that simply for the love of money. Yeah. And it comes down to it. There's proper reasons for war. There's proper reasons for self-defense. Yes. And so when you're attacked, you know, as a nation, you can stand up and fight against them. That's powerful. And basically that's what crime is. It's a small war. Yeah. And we're not being doing anything about it or being allowed to do anything about it today. And crime's coming in from everywhere. And basically it's my next door neighbor saying, I want what you've got. Yeah. And they come over to get it when the law protects you from that. And that's where you get the idea of perimeters being down. Or yeah, borders exactly. Down. Yeah. 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 Crime. So my backyard and here's my fence and yeah. that kind of thing is okay. It is okay. Yeah, unless you're trying to just be a hermit and never talk to anybody. <laughs> well, that's why we have locks in our doors. That's why uh-huh. I have all that. You know, you, you bring out another point here that also is to stop immorality. Yeah. Immorality. Is that kind of part yes. of Yes. Because it's usually immoral nations that want to attack other nations and spread their sin. Ah. And, uh, you know, so the point is, is that God made weapons for def- defense, not for offense, not to go to attacking other people. That's and so, so that's why you have it. It's a defensive weapon. Yeah. You know, Pastor Bob, you know, when I look at this book and I look at this conversation, um, you know, a lot of people say today, you know, in the 80s, they had all the, uh, what do they call it, band-aids where they'd say, yeah. you know, all this stuff, yeah. give peace a chance. Um you know, the question that's asked, and you asked the, the question, is world peace possible? Yes, but it's going to take Jesus Christ to achieve it. In the meantime, we're not going to have it. And in the meantime, carry your weapons, have your weapons, yeah. and those types of things. And that's what God is, is telling us through that. So uh, it's important to understand that until Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to always be wars and rumors of wars. Yeah. And the only ones going to stop wars altogether is Jesus Christ. And it's also interesting at the end of the millennium, a war breaks out. A war breaks out right at the end of the I millennium. Know. I mean, one of the greatest right sizings yeah. ever. A thousand years, Jesus fixes everything and war breaks out. Well, think about this. Perfect environment, we have a war. Environment <laughs> doesn't cause war or not cause war. Yeah. Environment is not man's problem. 
and we want to have the UN and all this because we want to change man's environment. If we could just get the environment right, yeah. they'll be okay. They'll be okay. No, because the problem's internal, it's not external. Problem. <laughs> the problem is not the city government or the fact that we have roads with potholes. If we can get rid of all this and give everybody a chicken in a pot, we'll be okay. Right. No, because the problem's not out here. The problem's inside here. And it starts with Jesus Christ becoming your Savior and bringing peace to a war-filled person. Pastor Bob, I've noticed that, you know, just jumping over to this, that our military is really being attacked. Mm -hmm. There's things going on with that. That's a demonic assault. It like is. Defund the police, all that. That's right. Demonic assault. Well, it comes back to they don't want anyone overseeing you. They just kind of control you. When well, there has to be control because we have the nature of the flesh, demons, and Satan in this world, we have to have laws and cooperating with that. But it seems like the longer you have laws is eventually they deteriorate. Yeah. And the attorneys turn the opposite direction, but it all comes back to one thing. It's still the love of money. They're after the money. Yeah, it's just like the devil. Follow the money trail, basically. Mm. They're after the money. That's what nations are after, and they're trying uh -huh. to shut down. You know, you're seeing all this stuff take place and, and what's going on. Let's let's talk about this for a second. You, you wrote in here about separation of church and state. Uh-huh. And, you know, I have thoughts on that, but what... What are your thoughts when you say that? It's yes and no. There is a proper way to have separation of church and state. You don't want the state running it without morality, so the church has to be there. But on the other hand, you don't want the church running it because that's when you start getting into our church is better than yours. And who gets to sit here? A Baptist? Oh, no, no, no Baptist. We're yeah. going to put a Catholic there. Oh, no, no. And we start fighting among ourselves. You have to come back to it that we need what the Word teaches as far as morality and, you know, separation of church and state is true, but not necessarily true. It's a blend between the two. We often jump on one side or the other, right. and it's not. We have to have both church and state working together. Properly and properly together. Properly and together. What you need is good people running the nation who have given their lives to Jesus, know what proper morality is, uh, without trying to turn this into a revival, okay? Without trying to turn this into a giant church. Right. And that's not the way it works. Look what look what happened with the Catholic Church when it took. Oh, yeah. Terrible things happened. Yep. Some of the worst atrocities happened when the Catholic Church took over in, in world history. And so the Crusades were handled by religion, trying to make everybody into our religion. Yes. Yeah. And then Christians get together. We argue, my view's wrong. <laughs> Your, your view's wrong. Mine's right. <laughs> and to add to this, too, I think about this, how the church today gets upset with certain people we put in politics. Oh. Or you think of 45 when he was in, and they were saying, I don't like the way he does this. I don't like the way he tweets. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is we're not electing a pastor. No. That's that's for also church no. and state, I think. Is that kind of something? Exactly. That's same? exactly it. Yeah. What you need is a moral person in there. And, uh, you know, that practices morality and, yes. and, and and talks about that. And that's what law should revolve around. Yeah, that's so. Powerful. But if you get two people together, they don't even want, often have the same definition of morality. And even back in our founding, it goes all the way back there. We had the same problems in yeah. those days. We need to strive for unity and strive for the proper thing to do and realize we're going to get as close as possible, but no perfection is going to be here until Jesus comes back. So what does the church do right now? We got the wars, the rumors of wars. You know, I, I, always, I often joke about like this thing, the World Economic Forum, and I joke about all this crazy stuff going on in the world and people saying, we need a great reset, you know, all the things. Right? Uh -huh. So what is the church's response to global tyranny? Like, how should we respond? Well, the main thing goes back to, yes, we should. I think the two things. Number one, let's get people saved as fast as possible. Come on. Number two, get Christians to get involved in the warfare. In other words, we need more Christians who understand the Bible in the military than, than, yeah. ha than making it all, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, whoever's popular, whoever wants it, we'll give you a paycheck or something like that. We have to have that because throughout the Word of God, it was the believers, Old Testament, that won the battle against wow. the uh, infidels or against the satanic armies that came against them. And the same things happened in our own nation. We had times when churches would take, and after the service was over, throw open a table, and you can come and register and get into the military and defend our nation. Because these guys that come to church understand morality better than anyone because they know the author of morality. So it's not good. a school or it's not just a decision you make or gritting your teeth to do something right. Morality started with God. Yeah, it started with God. Yeah. There's a, a popular teaching out right now, and you know and I appreciate a lot of it, but it's the seven mountains revelation. Yes. That whole thing. What... Uh, you know, is that that's a good example of what we should do, but that should be through influence, yes? Or yeah, that... yeah, I don't know where I stand exactly on the seven mountains. According to the Bible, it's not really 
the mountains of men. It represents the seven world empires that oh. come up until that time. And it's really the, the tribulation is a conglomeration of every religion, of every wrong religion, of every oh, demonic God. rebel they yeah. came from. And it starts with uh, Egypt, where they held them in slavery, goes past that to the next ones. All of the seven that are there, including right up to Rome itself, all seven mountains represent those ones. And it's really de the demonic forces that were in all their religions. Mm -hmm. And so, and they, they're the ones that came against God. They came against the Jews. They came against the Christians and all that. And all this is going to come together as a massive thing under demonic control. Yeah. That's how I see it. Whether it's got these other effects in it of, the, of you know, the seven different, uh, you know, uh, movies and yeah. and all the other stuff and entertainment, all, yeah. education, all that. Yes. I'm thinking, yes, but you know what have really affected that was demonic things in themselves. That's right. I really don't see the fact that we're going to come and overhaul the thing is going to be destroyed and then started again. Yeah. By Jesus Christ himself. Come on. Pastor so Bob. that's how I see it. I and think that's uh, right. I, yeah. I, that's how I read the Bible. But it's not a heaven or hell issue. It's not a heaven or hell issue. <laughs> I'm willing to wait till I'm flying through the air to say, see, <laughs> see I told you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well, I know. It's, it's, it's Rick and I do that. <laughs> you do you? Yeah. Rick Ritter. He's Rick, fun. He's fun. Rick is so fun. And uh -huh. you guys have such a great history. It's interesting, you know, when we're talking about national defense, we're talking about governments. If the church isn't taking its role, I believe that we're allowing things to happen all the way. And this is kind of jumping into an extreme topic with this. But you and I have talked about everything from UFOs to uh, crazy world events, weird manifestations that are going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And I believe when the church does not take its proper place in society mm -hmm. and wicked governments are doing things or maybe mad scientists for all we know are doing things, I think it can begin to open up demonic ability yes. into the natural. Do you see it that way? Yeah, there's no other way to explain a lot of stuff we're seeing than the fact it has to be demonic. Yeah. And I was listening to a minister one day, he was talking about they'd just taken a film, a video, uh, the uh, uh, Navy had, mm -hmm. and there was a light under the water that came this way at about four or 500 miles an hour under the water and suddenly did a 90 degree went that way. And they said it's scientifically impossible. Under the you water. You cannot go and make that turn without slowing down, without mm -hmm. something. And this thing did not, they did not lose one thing. They said, there's only one thing. It has to be demonic. It has to. I believe a lot of things right now that demonic things from the past that we've never even seen before that have been hit are now coming to the thing and it's to scare people. Yes. And it still comes back to this. Go ahead, Satan, throw your best. Come on. Ours is better. Oh, ours is better. <laughs> Come on. You walk over, but you go limping back. Well, think about the people that didn't know how strong God was until, you know, a nine foot giant stepped up in front of David and all oh, of a sudden man. this small little kid knocked him down <laughs> and killed him, you know? That's when you begin to realize greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. to me, this is Satan's last hurrah. He's trying everything he can. And he's still going to lose. He's still going to lose. I like what you say. He's been a loser since the beginning. Yep. He may stir up the nations, make them rage, whatever. But in the end, he'll lose again. Just but you know what gives me about it that I have to say, not bad. He never gives up. He tries again. He tries again. And again. <laughs> he lost in the garden. Yeah. He lost at the cross. Come on, Pastor Bob. You know, and he's going to lose again at Armageddon. But he still goes, I think I can do it better this time. I think I'll try again. I'll try a do-over. I know. Again. Well, I believe this too, that, you know, when we're talking that the church has such a responsibility just to, to be the yeah. light in darkness. And when they're not, I believe when we get carnal and allow more and more of a natural idea to run the world and all that, and again, uh -huh. there's different segments, but the more we allow things without the power of God, I think the more we're going to allow those manifestations. And there's almost a movement today that's moving the church away from spirit-filled living and or into an intellectual setting. Right. And that's what I was allowing dark supernatural things to right. manifest. In national defense, I think we need to be part of the uh, the spiritual wall that holds that back as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. On one hand, it's kind of fearful times we're living in. On the other hand, it's it's so exciting. It is, Pastor. Because Bob. the worse it gets, you realize we're moving closer and closer. And the coming of Jesus' kingdom could be just seven years away at any moment. It is seven years, years away. That's right. That's a good point. Because uh, seven years always seems to be this thing that everybody argues about. And uh, I like what you say. When we're flying through the air, then we'll just have to say, well, here we yeah. are. Yeah. But it's seven years everybody argues about. And I just, I, I really am looking forward to that day when we stand together with the Lord at the great millennium, the millennial reign, I should say, uh -huh. the thousand year reign. And I think that's going to be a profound time. Yeah, it will be. Pastor Bob, just a final thought with this too. We're not destined to live in heaven forever. We got all these nations and things we're working on. 
are, we're going to live as terrestrial beings in the yes. long run. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And uh, we can go to heaven or come back to here. But the point of it is, let me just give you a little rundown. Please. God had created the universe and all that's out there. It says God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. The earth was mentioned second. Heavens first. The universe. Or was Pastor Bob messing with me here, again? Here's, <laughs> and then he created the earth. Yeah. He created the universe with his fingers. Psalm 8. The universe, the works of the stars and all that are the works of your fingers. Mm. He made the world with his hands. It says that the earth declares his handiwork. And so he made the earth. Okay. <laughs> so we have that. But in Isaiah 53, the redemption chapter, who has believed us and who's the arm of the Lord been revealed. Do you have more strength in your fingers, your hands, or your arm? It took more power to redeem us than it did to create the entire universe. Oh. And when Jesus arose from the dead, the greatest arm wrestling match in all history took place. Mm. God slapped down that hand of Satan mm. and defeated him. So it comes back to what we see around us. So here's the point. Heaven and earth have always worked together. People ask me to believe on there's life on any other planet. Yes, heaven. <laughs> but on any other planet? <laughs> no. No. That's our playground. Yeah. Forever and forever. In fact, so much so that when God created the earth, he spent so much time on it, making everything just correct and proper. And it messed up and he did it again. A flood, this do this again. He works and works and works on it, but he doesn't work on all that out there. Yeah. It's there. But then heaven itself is going to come and rest over the earth forever because heaven and earth have always worked together. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. We go down scripture after scripture after scripture, how the two work together. This is the only place prayer will work. If two shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them. This is the only place your sins can be forgiven, that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. You can't find sin on any other planet because God's keeping it clean so that one day when, when all sin is gone, you and I can go out to the most enormous places on the in the universe, let's go see the Pleiades. We're there oh. just that fast. We don't travel the speed of light. We travel the speed of thought like angels do. Wow. You think angels take millions of years to get from heaven to earth to answer our <laughs> prayer? We can start a prayer by the time we get to admit it's he's there, there. They've gone to heaven and back. And that's how fast we'll be able to travel. The world, the earth will be, pardon me, the universe will become our playground. Amazing. I know. So there's where it comes back to is that God the things that he worked on the hardest are the things he has for us. That's amazing, Mr. Yes. Bob. You Actually, you just tied a lot of that together for me in a way I'd not fully thought of before. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful that we have that. So we, we get into nations and all this, but really the future is so bright. I know. I mean, it's where we're going. So this is the book I, that kind of inspired today. Yeah. It's The Bible and National Defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, where can we get this? At bobyandian.com. That's the place that you can go and you can find it. And uh, a lot of other books that are available there, too. But this one, uh, when I first put it out, I had our congressmen, senators from Oklahoma bought those, took them to Washington with them. And, Is that and, right? Yeah. And a, a lot of um, people in our church, that their sons and daughters were in the military and kind of not knowing, do I do this? Is it right to stand up for our nation? And I put that book out. Just well, I really enjoy this book, yeah. and I thank you for writing it. And you got a lot of books, and you do a daily teaching. Yes. YouTube, your your uh, yeah. website, yeah. any other places. It's called Student of the Word. Student of the Word. Yes. So good, Pastor yeah. Bob. I treat everybody like a student. Like a student. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really enjoy it, and we've benefited so much from your ministry. And Pastor Bob, would you just very yeah. quickly today, would you pray for our audience? Okay. Father, with wars and rumors of wars and all the things that are going on around the world today, not just our country, but around the world. Father, with lawlessness increasing, you promised us in the midst of all this, don't be concerned. Yes. Don't be afraid. So, Father, we choose today not to be afraid, knowing what the end is going to be. It may take a while to get there, but, Father, it's going to come. Yes. And we thank you that you've given us enough previews of what's coming so that we can know you have the whole thing in your hand. Yes. So we rejoice in that. So Father, I ask right now, ministers out there, yes. congregational people, those that know Jesus Christ need to quit acting like the world full of fear. Father, we know who holds the future. We know who holds us in his hand. Yes. It is Jesus Christ himself. So today we choose fear. You are gone. You are gone. Father, we choose to rest in the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we give you praise for it, that not only will our testimony be effective, 
but our walk of peace will be so envious from other people. How do you do that in the midst of a world falling apart? Yes. His name is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So we give you praise for it today. Thank you for this broadcast. Thank, thank you for Jesus. Pastor. Thank you for Joseph. Thank you for his family. Thank you for his calling. The Father, in this world, you have a prophet standing up to simply telling us this is the way to go, and this is how it fits in with the rest of life and the rest of the Word of God. I thank you for him. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Man, but I sure appreciate you. I appreciate you too. Thank you for being on our broadcast, and I, I can't wait to have you back again sometime. Thank you. Soon, if you would. Yeah. And let's do a conference together. Let's do a too. conference okay. together. How many of you like to, man? I'll be the prophet, you be the pastor. Okay, we'll try that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I, I You really... might be able to pass. I'm not really sure I'm the prophets. <laughs> I can do the prophecy part. <laughs> Well, Pastor Bob, I value you and I honor you. Just thank, thank you, you for being with me. Thank you. Praise God. Well, everybody, let me look right at you. I just bless you today. I speak the peace of God over you. I just want to thank you for being here. And I hope you were as blessed as I have been by having Pastor Bobby Andian with us. And so thanks for check inviting out. me. Oh, sir. It's an honor. And please, if you would, go to his uh, site, go to his information. It's on the screen here and uh, check out Pastor Bobby Andian. And those of you who are with us today, if you are a partner, thank you so much. If you want to become one, you go to josephz.com. We're just so grateful for you. And if you would, please watch this next part. In today's world, there's a lot of noise and sensationalism by many claiming to hear the voice of God. They cite their predictions and their own experiences. Now, some are legitimate and some are not, but how do we know the difference? In some ways, prophecies become a mystified topic. Yet as global chaos is obviously increasing, it is imperative that we must hear and know the voice of God and true prophecy. I'm Joseph Z, and I just wrote this book, Demystifying the Prophetic. Now, it's taken me my whole life of walking through the Word of God and my own encounters and experiences to bring this to a place where we land at biblical truth and sound doctrine, yet absolutely celebrating the precious gift of prophecy. In this book, I deal with everything from trances and dreams, visions, deja vu even, different types of prophets, we talk about it. We even cover the topic of false prophets, how do you determine who's true and who's false? We talk about discerning the times, navigating strange encounters. People talk about angels appearing to them, entities appearing to them, they hear voices. All of these unique things we begin to deal with at a very powerful level with this book. I bring you straight to the written word of God. And I wanna to say to you, isn't it time we understand the purpose of prophecy? After all, it is the spirit of prophecy that gives testimony to Jesus. It's time for results in your life. It's time for you to begin demystifying the prophetic. This book will help you. I promise you need this book. It'll break you out of containment. It'll bring you into a place of clarity and it will open up the understanding of the voice of God and prophecy functioning in your life by the written word of God. This is gonna really help you. I encourage you to get your copy today by going to josephz.com. I wanna say a very special thank you to our partners. Whether you've been a partner with us from the very beginning, or if you've recently become part of our partner family, we simply wanna say thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you because it means so much that you're standing with us. We're accomplishing a lot together. And I'll tell you, if you're interested in becoming part of our partner family, I'd encourage you to go to josephz.com or text the keyword GIVE to 719-259-0029. You know, we want to welcome you to the family and we will be calling you. If you become a partner, we call you regularly and we love talking to you. Our team calls you. It's not a call center. It's our team. We love our partners. I hope you'll consider it. I hope you're praying about it and I hope you become a part of our partner family today.